Alhamdulillah. Okay, Salaamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah. What episode are we on, bro? Oh, uh, we're on 48. 48, mashallah. And I'm here, uh, I'm Amin, of course, joined with my co host, Muhammad, also known as Akhi Tweet, also known as Breakfast on Podcast. Breakfast um, Cast. What are you having with your breakfast pancakes? Oh, my, my wife made some pancakes and we're having some uh, knockoff Nutella brand, which is a, it's called okay. Natoka. Uh, Aldi version. <laughs> yeah, baby. <laughs> okay, nice, nice. So yes, I was going to ask you actually before we, like yesterday I thought of talking about this a little bit on the podcast. Um, are you doing keto? Obviously not. Obviously not. <laughs> <laughs> are you are you still doing fasting at all? Or? I don't think I'm doing anything at the moment. I okay. probably should, but maybe just like working and dealing with kids and stuff. Yeah, I think okay. after um, I'm going to Morocco in a couple of weeks, inshallah. Inshallah, and um, maybe when I come back, then we'll see. Mm. What's the occasion? What for going to Morocco? Yeah, um, my wife and my son have never really been to my like family over there mm -hmm. so I thought we'd you know I've got to do one of the trips in it so I've, I've been to Tunisia we've been to Algeria now we have to give Morocco it's it's mm. share and it's right <laughs> very good where are you from again in Morocco in uh, La Reish, which isn't too far from Tanja oh that's why you're sick bro because you're from the north bro what do they call it a reef yeah, exactly bro a reefy habibi reefy yes basically well, Reef culture is very similar to Western Algerian culture. Mm. So that's that's basically my area. So like there's a lot of crossover, man. But it's like you'll find that people from the reef in Morocco are sim are more similar to Western Algerians than they are similar to like people from south of Morocco or the west, whatever you want to call it. Right. Um, so, yeah, sick, man. When it comes um, to culture, though, I'm not really too clued up. Like, there's probably all sorts of stuff that is traditional that I wouldn't really know because I'm not. Yeah, that yeah. Engaged. But even 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 down to the um, dialect and stuff, it's it's pretty similar. Oh right. Yeah, like uh, you know, sometimes I speak and people think I'm Moroccan, you know, because the the dialect is similar. You mm. know, uh, let me think. For example, uh, we say Dieli. Yeah, I'm sure Dieli. you guys say Dieli. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't, uh, as far as I remember, they don't actually say that in like the west, uh, the east of Algeria, or maybe even the central. It's seen as a Moroccan thing, although we say it as well um, because we're all together in it. Like the border is pretty new thing. So, what do they yeah. say then in the other side? Uh, they say Tai. Oh, that's similar to Tunisia. So mm, exactly. Tunisia won't say they'll say in Tai, they'll put an N sort of Yeah, we we'll say in Tai, yeah. yeah. Exactly. And um uh, I wanted to ask you actually, you know, in Tunisia, your when you speak like uh or where you're from in Tunisia, yeah, do they have that uh thing where they say, for example, they have a little thing at the end where they'd be like, La Bessa Um no, I don't know. Maybe, yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah. Not maybe, not maybe. <laughs> maybe not in my uh, my sort oh, of neck of the woods. Area. Okay. Yeah. yeah, but I do. I am familiar with it. because uh, I know in East Algeria, like Anaba, Constantina, they they have that man. It's so weird, but it's yeah. pretty cool. But it's weird, man. <laughs> I'm like, Lebesa. why are you adding this sound at the end? <laughs> yeah. Alhamdulillah, man. Um, so obviously I'm back in the UAE. I just arrived. Was it probably two days ago? No way! You um, left me. Yeah, man. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm I'm glad that my internet's holding up. My internet's been good, man. I did like a webinar the other day, and it was holding up well. So I was gonna like upgrade, but uh, we'll see. We'll see. I mean, so far it's all right, man. Mm. Um, uh, I went through. I had a bit of a incident at the airport. Um, Bro, we had a ton of luggage, right? Like, we're oh, officially no. Arab now because we had a ton <laughs> of luggage. So I, I'm going through. I went through passport control, everything very smooth. You know, Dubai Airport is, is really good, to be honest. Yeah. Um, so I go through. I'm thinking we are prime targets to be checked by customs because yeah. of the amount of lug luggage we have. Yeah. So we, we're walking through customs. You know, we just keep going. We don't declare anything. And the three policemen, you know, customs police, they're just uh, just standing, you know, looking at people, who should they search or whatever. And we walk right past them. 
Yeah. And I could hear them, bro. They were they were saying something about us. So I can't remember like, the words used, but it felt like they were like, so should we check these a lot? Or, <laughs> yeah. you know? And, and we went past, right? Um, but then after going past, they called me back. They said, yeah, put your luggage through the scanner. Uh, and then they had to, one of the suitcases, they, they completely... They took it basically to a side and they completely emptied it. But I, the reason I wanted to mention this because, you know, it's, it's sometimes I like to pick out positive things, right? So, uh, of course, everybody's got to have customs and they got to check everything. But um, the way they did it was very good. You know, they took me to the side. They op- they took the suitcase and he emptied the entire suitcase, but he em- emptied it in a very, like, methodical way so that it was easy to put back, you know, and he didn't, like, just imagine you could just unzip it and just open it onto the floor yeah but he didn't he didn't do that at all and he's he's you know polite the whole way and then after checking it turns out i had something i should have declared um after finding that thing he he then put everything back himself he didn't even ask me to do it which I'm, in many countries i'm sure they would make you do that so i just want to mention that because i mean maybe not on the podcast but sometimes i'm a bit negative about things but this was very good, alhamdulillah. And, you know, uh, Emiratis, yeah, they're, they're not the smiley, giggly type, yeah? They're not cracking jokes kind of people. But they are, you know, when they're nice, they're very polite. They're very, you could say, professional. Yeah. And, yeah, man, I, I like it. I like the, it's, it's culture, isn't it? It's like the culture of just being, I don't know, hospitable maybe? I don't know. Like mm-hmm. uh, the guy who checked my suitcase, he took me to his manager to see what to do about this thing I should have um, declared. And the, what's the first thing the manager says to me? He's like, Kif Halik. Yeah. yeah. The first thing he said to me. He didn't say anything, just, How are you? That's the first thing he said. So that was really nice, man. And then later, you know, the next day, I, I had to go to a government office. And there's a lady, Emirati lady, she's like uh, dealing with customers or whatever. And uh, I had to get like a stamp on a paper, yeah. So she's like, she's like peeling the sticker off. She's like, Bismillah. She sticks it on the paper, Bismillah. She gets the stamp, she stamps it, Bismillah. Everything, Bismillah. <laughs> uh, so that was, that's really nice as well. And, you know, you definitely find these things. Uh, depends maybe on the Emirate because each area has its own culture. Some areas are less touched by globalization, I suppose. Yeah. But that's nice, man. I like you know it's good to pick out positive things. Um, you know, a lot of, a lot of obviously what we're surrounded with is negative. You know, so sometimes you gotta, you gotta say good when it's good, isn't it? Gotta celebrate the small little victories, bro. Yeah, yeah. How's it? How are you anticipating it's gonna be going to Morocco? Whether uh, you know traveling or like uh, you know when arriving and stuff. I don't know. I think my flight there is going to be quite late, um, mm. so I'm hoping. So a man just falls asleep, <laughs> but mm. it's going to be. It's just always difficult, bro. Like you always see those families that are, they're traveling with kids, and then you think, "Wow, they've got it tough." And then yeah, yeah. now that you become that family, you're just like, "Oh my god." Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But there's always there's always things in my mind, man. Like you know, my, everyone knows now. My wife wears niqab and stuff, and. That traveling like that can often be a bit of a trial because it depends how um, forthcoming and, and helpful the staff are. So, for example, in mm. the UK, you know, she'll get to the we'll get to the security gate and um, you know they'll check our passports and that, and then without saying anything, you know, the staff mm. member, this border agency, or whatever, will get up, uh, call someone who's a uh, you know female. They'll come, they'll mm. check. Obviously, my wife's identity, and then they'll, and then we'll carry on, and it's fine. Um, in um, in Tunisia, <laughs> we went to Tunisia, bro. Mm. Uh, we got to the thing. He's checking, and then he goes. Um, there was a, obviously a guy. Mm. I don't know if it's police or border force, whatever. He goes, all right, I need to see your wife's face, and I, and then mm. she was just like, no. I mean, you got got a woman, and he mm. was like, he looks at me and he goes, listen, I don't want to see your wife's face, but I need to see your wife's face. Do you think I want to yeah. see your wife? And I was like there's got to be a woman working here like she can just nod to you that it's the same person and he yeah. he gets up looks around goes there's no woman here man there's no woman I need to see your wife's yeah. face yeah. and then she, yeah. she's just stuck to her guns my wife just stuck yeah. to her guns eventually he, he finds some woman I think I think she was working for the police or something she was dressed in the mm. uniform yeah 
either that or oh no she was selling um she was one of those people that sell sim cards you know mm. when you when okay, you get there. okay. And she, t- she took my wife so, to the toilet so i guess she wasn't pleased <laughs> yeah took my wife to the toilet checked her came back and nodded and that was the end of that right but there was no need to be so because you know it's not like it's an isolated incident there's people that come and go all the time mm. you know in, in tunisia mm. but that just sort of shows you um yeah, so I'm a bit like, ooh, don't know what, what it's going to be like. That's, that's always going to be one of the mm. things. Um, mm. I would guess there's more people wearing niqab in Morocco than Tunisia, right? Yeah, and it might not even be people that are from that country. Like, it's always going to be yeah, people yeah. that are... Foreigners, yeah. Foreigners yeah. coming in and out. But yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming they'll be more mm. sort of cooperative because that's just mm. the vibe I get from Morocco. Mm. I think... It, you know what it is? It's like, it's just what's normal and not normal like maybe the guy what the guy's trying to say is look bro it's not such a big deal i'm not like looking in that way it's not a big deal like let's just get on with it yeah that's that's from his point of view he's saying he's thinking it's not a big deal like why are you making a big deal out of it so you know but then obviously if he had more people like you coming through then he might understand in a different way you know Mm. um like you know actually now that i think about it my friend um he said, you know, his wife was coming into UAE. Like, he was coming into UAE with his wife. She wears niqab. And, you know, UAE niqab's kind of uh, common. But she still had to show her face to a man, I think. Um, I don't know, just for some reason. There were no women or... So they don't actually accommodate for it. I mean, maybe from their perspective, it's like one-off thing doesn't matter. They're not thinking about fard or not fard. You know, they're just thinking that... You know, it's a preference that women have, and um, I'm sure she can compromise just one-off kind of thing. So even here, I don't think they really accommodate. But, uh, you know, in the UK, what it's like, man, it's like all this uh, political... uh, What's the word? Political correctness. Yep. Um, And and trying not to be caught out in that way. But also, bro, you got to say, the UK is all about training like they have training for how to deal with probably every different scenario or or the most common scenarios you know yeah so it's like that's the difference i feel in uae or or let me say saudi yeah when i went to hajj um, the guys at the border the passport thing they 100 percent. they're not trained they've never been trained they were shown how to use the computer and that's it they weren't shown how to deal with humans, you know. Right. So, yeah. so that's why they're so terrible. You know, I could say they were terrible, bro. One guy's watching YouTube on the job. One guy's cracking jokes yeah. about the customer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> One guy's like got his foot up on the table. Like they've not been trained. Obviously, you you would you could say this should you shouldn't need to train people for that, but um, you know there is definitely an aspect of if we just left the people in the uk who do that job if we just left them to do it without any training they would also be rude and and terrible but they've been trained thoroughly to do it a certain way and that's why i think in even in the uae the customs people they also have been trained you can tell that they've been trained they've got a protocol whereas the guys at the passport side i don't think they have been trained so it comes down to like uh training a lot of the time man I feel like, I don't know if this is true, but it's always been sort of a um, consideration of mine that with with the countries where we see this sort of lack of uh, protocol is probably because, um, obviously, there's a lack of accountability. So there's a lack of independent sort of observation and, yeah. and criti- you know, a, a body that will investigate things. But I think yeah. as well, the way that the jobs are sort of attained is through um, mm. who you know yeah. as opposed to what you can bring to the table so like yeah. people probably attain jobs there because they know someone who knows someone or it's a relative that works yeah, there yeah, yeah. or someone you know and mm. that doesn't really happen here because in the uk mm. obviously we you know we, we make our job applications and if we if we receive too many complaints or something severe or disciplinary then we're out we're replaced with someone yeah. who can do the yeah, job yeah, better yeah. yeah that that's that's a big deal yeah it's true and that's Probably out of the whole Arab world, the UAE might be the least bad in that sense. Um, they definitely, I, I don't know how or why they decide to focus so much on it, but seems like from day one, they just didn't want any corruption. And you can pretty much say there is very, very little corruption. Mm-hmm. Um, it comes down to, I was talking to my dad about this exact topic, and I was thinking, 
in the UK, um, these border people, they don't get paid amazingly, right? Mm. So surely they are, they could be tempted to take bribes, for example. Yeah. yeah? So why don't they take bribes? They're not getting paid amazingly, you know? Um, and he said, you know, it's probably because the justice system seems to be quite, um, basically, you're not going to slip through. Yeah. You're, if, if you get caught, you're really going to get done. Yeah. And that's that might be the reason. Whereas if you have hope that, you know, if you get caught, you can get out of it, you will be more tempted, isn't it? Mm. Um, I think in the UAE, for example, the, the justice system is, is pretty solid. And also they just pay these people very large amounts so that they're not even tempted to take any uh, bribes. Um, but it might be because the culture in the UAE, I don't know, this is just a guess, but it might be the culture isn't too embedded. There's a lot of people from a lot of different places. Um, but I could um, be wrong. The culture of what? As in the, the 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 mix of people, the mix of employees yeah. aren't all from the same place. Whilst if you have a an embedded culture that's been there for you know thousands of years or whatever you want to call it, yeah, um, then people have time to sort of uh, I don't know set like norms and and and, and uh, expectations. Like you know, if you're <coughs> you've you've always got this risk of being sort of uh, replaced I suppose in the UAE mm. because you're not all embedded and from the same place I could be wrong I'm co- I might be reading this completely wrong <laughs> mm. I but, think there's there's kind of two levels and two standards to everything in UAE there is the Emirati level and then there's the non-Emirati level right. um, you won't find an Emirati getting replaced by a non-Emirati you know that doesn't right. happen priority is Emiratis like when it comes to job or whatever um, so if you need to get rid of an Emirati, you're going to replace them with another one. Right. So they don't really have competition from non-Emiratis, I would say. Um, I just think it's it's been a priority not to have corruption, mm. even on the police level. It's the thing is it it must have been a very difficult task because the UAE is made up of tribes, and if you're in the same tribe, it's expected you're going to do favors for people in your tribe. You know. Yeah. Um, and definitely people are let off for that reason. Perhaps they're in the same tribe, you know, hook a brother up. But it just seems very small amount compared to what it really could be, mm. you know. There's, um, I suppose there is an element of discretion here as well. Like, mm-hmm. you know, in the police here, for example, like just because you've done something a specific way, like, you know, you've committed a specific offense mm. doesn't mean that there's only one um, outcome. Mm. A lot of it surprisingly is down to the officer's discretion um mm. obviously you know the officer would still have to take uh proactive you know they can't they have to take some sort of positive action yeah and they have to justify what they've done mm. but yeah it doesn't mean that you know they can inflict the harshest punishment um yes just yes. For, for you know just because yeah. they have to sort of thing um, yeah you've got to probably take into account so you got to take into account justice, but not only justice. You got to take into account the image of the police, you know, yeah. PR kind of thing. Yeah. You got to take, you know, you, you, even the reputation of police, you know, because if you if police start to have a bad reputation, people will report stuff less, people will yeah. trust them less, and that ruins policing in general, doesn't it? It yeah, it's crazy seeing like, you know, obviously studying um, policing law now. It's mm. just, in it's it's crazy because. Um, the amount of hoops that you have to jump through just to mm. do something right, like just to just to make an arrest, there's yeah. there's like a, a set list of things that have to be said and done mm. for that arrest to be lawful. Mm. And if it, if yeah. it isn't, if one of those things is missed out, yeah. then, for example, just because you've committed an offence mm-hmm. doesn't mean that um, you need to be physically arrested. Right. You understand? So, for okay. example, it could be something like. I don't know, let's say, basically there's a list of necessities that require an arrest. So one of them can be, um, <clears throat> like if there's children involved, one of them can be preventing uh, physical injury, mm-hmm. one of them is um, like obstructing the highway, mm-hmm. and one of them is uh, risk of damage to property, mm-hmm. and then a couple of them are like for a, like a prompt investigation, so like interview or searching, mm-hmm. and I think one of the last ones is like... Um, God, what was it? Did I say prevent disappearance? So if they're going to run away, oh, but basically, okay. if someone, yeah. if someone, let's say someone stole something, right? Mm. They've got no sort of inclination of running away. You've got the property back, or you know where the property is, or whatever. 
Um, yeah. And uh, basically, if you ha- you know they're not a risk to anyone, they're not going to beat up anyone. You yeah. can't just arrest them. Mm. You know what you would do is probably invite them in for a voluntary interview or something like that because they do that now. Like they'll invite you in so, for a voluntary interview where you basically yeah. come in, have a chat about it, interviewed about it, as opposed to like getting stuck in a cell for twenty four hours and all this other stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but how would you then give the consequences out if you're not even going to arrest them? Because because the, the consequences come after the investigation, so it could be. Oh, so you're going to let them go, investigate, yeah, so, and then summon them to court or something? Yeah, exactly. So you'll charge mm. them or you'll caution them. Or, and this is another thing. So, like, you might caution someone. If they haven't, if they haven't had a caution before for the mm-hmm. similar offence, so let's say mm-hmm. shoplifting, right? Mm-hmm. Um, shoplifting, it wasn't that much, you know. First time they've ever done something like this, just give them mm. a caution, you know. And it's, yeah. it goes on a record that they've been cautioned, but it's just a verbal yeah. sort of, you know, don't do it again mm. kind of thing. Right. And that's that's yeah. available for pretty much everything, more or less, mm. you know. But I'm not mm. saying it's going to be used for everything. It, you've just got to balance up the harm, and then yeah. basically everything has to be justified. You yeah, can, which you can means, do anything as long as you can mm. say this is why I did it, this is what I thought about, and this is why yeah. I didn't think it was in the public interest to go super harsh on this person. Yes, public interest discretion. But this, what this means, bro, is that the police must be pretty smart and very well trained. Yeah, isn't it? Like, also imagine very, you had, yeah. I was going to say also very sort of uh, cautious about their own actions because they can yeah. be, like it's it, you know as, as as much as we see the police as a big sort of um, a monolithic organization, it's made up of individuals, individuals that are mm-hmm. always going to be at risk and liable to um, complaints or criticism mm-hmm. or disciplinary. So. You're always trying to yeah. like cover yourself and do, you know, justify mm. why you do certain things. Mm. From what I know of the police in the UK, I always feel like they're too much on the side of being cautious. And like you said, there's so many l- hoops to jump through just to yeah. do something basic sometimes. And it's interesting because it probably comes from culture in the end. The UK's culture is very kind of polite and all of that queuing up and sorry for everything and all of that and and if you compare it to the u.s i mean the u.s has history of fighting and war you know civil war slavery um uh, having arms everyone having guns yeah this this uh, background and history creates a whole different policing culture doesn't it which will then influence the law so that's very that's actually very interesting even if you think about islamic law it's very difficult to just compare Islamic law versus, let's say, UK law because they come from two very different places. And if you don't take the culture and the history into account, then you almost can't compare it. It's just too different, coming from two different worlds. I'd be really interested in seeing how Islamic Sharia, Sharia law would like fully be implemented in modern day sort of... Um, Mm. Like because I've never, uh, it's something I do want to study. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just want to know how the how far the application goes. Yes. Do you understand? Because yes. yes, we have hudud for punishments. We have, but I don't know how like deep rooted legislation would work. Yeah, you know what it is, bro. I think that is a can of worms. A lot of people would be very uncomfortable with opening. Mm. You know, and the reason I say that is because you might have this uh, dreamland of what it looks like to implement Sharia fully. And then yeah. it may be that, you know, real qualified ulama decide to implement it in a different way to the way you dreamed up with yeah. your limited knowledge. Yeah. And that might actually be disappointment, you know, for people. You know, people have this uh, fantasy dream of, uh, you know, whipping people for yeah. <laughs> accusing a woman of X, Y, Z. And um, it might yeah. it might not be the way to implement it now. Who knows? Exactly. I mean, because... <sighs> You know, there, there is this sort of amateur sort of understanding of, of yes. Sharia that we can just, oh, implement it tomorrow. And, yeah, and it requires so much there. work. It's basically, man. it's like they're talking about a book of rules that they've never read. Yes, exactly. You know? Because exactly. if you were to read them, I know this mm. is, you know, I, I'm not saying I've read it extensively either, but if you were to yeah. sort of collate all of that and try and apply mm. it to modern day, the yeah. gaps that we'd have would be <laughs> incredibly big. Like, there'd be mm. huge gaps in our mm. market of understanding that mm. we're going to have to sort mm. of uh, come up with something obviously rooted in sharia mm. 
but mm-hmm. it will get, it's going to be the discretion of the ulama to make that exactly, decision. Exactly, yeah, exactly. And that's and, where you're going to have many different views of how to do it. Exactly. And I, probably, bro, the stuff like, you know, uh, accusing a woman of something, that's probably very straightforward compared to other stuff. There are a lot of crimes where the punishment is discretionary. And, yeah. and then you'd have a lot of disagreement over what, you know, what should be done. Um, so it's, it's, that's why I say it's, it's a can of worms that people might be uncomfortable with opening. Even though I'm saying they want to implement Sharia, it's just that what they had in mind may not become the reality. It'd be interesting. Um, I'm sure there's people that have written yeah. on it. Um, I'd love to read like a book on how it would actually physically uh, sort of uh, manifest itself. Mm. But there's yes. so much. Like there's so much to think about. Yeah. Like, think about even now, like cybercrime and stuff like that. Like that's just yes. one little can of worms itself. How yes. do you, you know, how do you police the internet uh, Sharia compliantly? Yeah, there's this, and also other things like, you know, fraud, for example, maybe. I'm not talking mm-hmm. about the whole picture. I'm talking about the intricacies. Like even something as simple as theft isn't always yeah. what it seems. Like there's a difference between mm-hmm. there's two. Like for burglary, for example, there's two different types of burglary. Essentially, there's a burglary where you you go into a house with the intention of stealing something or you know yeah. prep, property, and then there's also you're already in the property, and then you've got then you develop mm. the intention, and then the this is another thing. Like intention has to be considered mm. because it's not always clear cut. Mm-hmm. But yeah, and yeah, definitely. You know, bro. Going back to the whole accountability and stuff, I feel like um, the UK and to an extent the UAE is is one way. I think I, I'll I'll speak about Algeria because I've never been to Morocco. Um, Algeria is more like you know. I don't know if you ever worked in the corporate world, but people who work in the corporate world will will know. Yeah, that. Your manager doesn't, basically, your manager doesn't want to show, doesn't want to show you up because he's low standard, right? He's, yeah. he's not very, doing a very good job. So if he makes a big deal about you not doing a good job, then people start looking at him. So therefore, to keep the standards low everywhere, he lets you off with slacking so that he can slack. And then his boss will do the same thing and then right. the, they'll do the same thing. And so it's like everybody is just, want, they want to slack, right? Everybody is guilty basically. And in order to not get in trouble for whatever they've done, they don't want to tell anyone else off. So they won't hold anyone else accountable. You right. get it? That's what I feel like it's like in Algeria. It's like the customs guy might let you off because he knows that he's taken bribery. So he doesn't want to get the spotlight on him. You get it. And then yeah. his manager won't uh, tell him off for not stopping you because his manager will have done something wrong. And it goes all the way up to the highest level. And so th- this is this is how it is in the corporate world, including in the West, of course. And this is how I feel you know, the justice system is in most of the world, to be honest, is that yeah. everyone's slacking. Everyone's got low standards and it and it will just stay like that. Everyone will just kind of let people off because they know deep down that they've done something wrong and they don't want anyone to look into it. How and it, th- yeah. I was going to say, like, what do you think is a solution for our neck of the woods then to sort of get rid of that sort of stuff? Well, you know how it, uh, how I, I believe it works is you need, I mean, maybe one is, is an exaggeration, but you need one person who comes in and they actually do the work to the fullest extent. Okay, uh-huh. they, they have high standards. They hold themselves accountable. And when they start holding other people accountable, they have no fear because they've got nothing to hide. Yeah. You get it. And so if, if, I'm, if I know I'm clean, I'm doing everything correctly, and I start telling, like, you're my subordinate, and I tell you, why are you slacking? Why are you doing this? He can't do nothing. Like, he can't yeah. say, oh, but you did this because I've done nothing. <laughs> yeah. The only problem with that, Muhammad, is when somebody comes in and, and speaks like that and does that kind of thing, the whole system will be against them because he's the only clean one. Everyone yeah. else has dirt on their hands. And so they might find a way to conspire to get him out. So that's the problem. Maybe it requires a bit of a more nuanced approach or a, a more transitionary thing. Yeah. But I feel that's how it happens. If you start, it starts from, it's leadership basically. It starts from you holding yourself accountable and you having high standards. And then maybe bit by bit you start 
uh, holding other people to higher standards mm. and really and truly helping them, you know, helping them raise their levels, helping them understand what high standards looks like, helping them understand that holding them accountable is not a personal thing. It's something that will help the whole system work better. I, um, um, I remember years ago uh, seeing um, a big campaign about like anti-bribery campaigns in Morocco and they were showing it on TV. Like there was be every other advert was like, you know, mm. talking about if, if you if you've been made to sort of uh, uh, you know deal in a bribe or whatever, then you should report it and it's not mm. acceptable and all this stuff. And this was coming, you know, from the King of Morocco down. Um, right. I'd like to see. Obviously, when I go, I'm going to speak to people and see if how that's actually played out and if it's made a difference. Mm. Um, because it's interesting. Because if there is legitimate fear from the top down, mm -hmm. um, regardless really of what the top the top do yeah there's still fear because you could cut it off essentially i'm not saying that the top are, are, are corrupt or whatever i don't know that to say that mm. but hypothetically if the top were but they would still instill fear on anyone below them to yeah. do that then they you know it might still work it might be enough yeah um, yeah yeah that's yeah. true yeah sometimes that's all, that's all that's required the problem is is that you know, you, you've probably heard of the situations where you want to get something done with the local, whatever, the municipality, the council, whatever. Yeah. You want to get something done. The only way to get it done is with bribery. So now if you pay bribery just to get on with your life, now are you going to get in big trouble? Like, is that fair? Yeah. When the, that's the problem is when it's so entrenched and, and it's built up, it's like everyone's in trouble in a way. Yeah. You know, obviously, I, I, I think... Whenever I've heard of my family members being, you know, in that situation, they have refused to pay a bribe. Um, but sometimes that closes a whole potential career path or whatever off to you just because yeah. you won't pay a bribe. I think um, it was my cousin. The government was offering people land for farming. Yeah, they wanted to encourage oh, yeah. farming. And so they would they were willing to give you the land for free and then you do all the rest yourself. OK, right. this was government land. So my cousin like wanted to go and apply for that. He's actually very enthusiastic about getting into farming and using these modern techniques and stuff. And it, he got blocked off because of bribery. You know, he just wouldn't pay. And so they're like, OK, bye bye. You know, yeah. so imagine some your whole life could change because uh, or your whole life path is stopped because of such a thing, you know. And this is not even somebody taking. It's somebody who's, you know, asked to pay it. Um, awful, isn't it? It's uh, yeah. like I remember, you know, Tunisia being like that. Where it'd be something silly, like we're we're coming off of the boat, so we when we used to drive there, mm -hmm. um, we, you know, we'd have stuff with our stuff in our car, uh, and we'd been driving across France and Europe, whatever, for like at least three or four days. Um, yeah. So we we finally got to Tunisia, and the queues are incredibly long to get off the mm. boat, and then you've got you're queuing from the boat. This is all in the cars, by the way. So from the boat to yeah. the Diwana, which is obviously like the border control and stuff. Customs, yeah. Customs. Um, and you're just waiting there for hours and hours on end while they check every car and stuff. Mm. And they'll always come up with some problem, right? And mm. I remember like thinking back to it, it must have been so hard for my dad because you know we were all sort of young kids, you know, me and my sisters and then my mum and my dad all in the car, cramped mm. up, full of stuff. Yeah. You know, and they check in and they finally get there, they check in, they check in, they check in, oh well, you know, you're missing this and you can't do that and blah 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 and blah 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 and we're already dying. Like we're yeah. boiling hot, like and then my dad is just obviously pissed off with them and he knows what they want. Mm. But he's trying to long it out as much as possible and then eventually especially when they see and this is the worst, is when they see obviously, you know, people like ourselves where we they know we're not from um, yeah. we're not living there we're you know from Khadaj whatever you want to call it so yeah. they take advantage of that um, yeah. getting their summer sort of bonus sort of thing through, mm. through their yeah. own citizens really because if you think about it long term and, and large scale mm. we are probably bringing the most amount of tourism into their country in yeah. the sense that when we when we do come we stay for a long time you know yeah. we spend a lot of money there we're not coming mm -hmm. for like a week and spending it in an isolated environment which is yeah. like the hotels and the you know the touristic areas we're, in, we're we're actually injecting it deep into the population yeah like that's where that money goes um but when you when you treat your own citizens like this or your own sort of culture 
people like this, then mm. it just makes them a hateless society and never want to come back because mm. it's so deeply embedded. And it shows yeah. you like the, the the importance of delayed gratification because if that person, if those people in authority thought a bit w- wider with their mind instead of the here and now, then mm. they'd see the benefits, you know. But it's a shame. Yeah, thing. that's true, man. That's true, and it's so dirty, man. Allah, it's so dirty. But I think you know these people. Yeah, they're often Allah not evil people. Yeah, they just they just think that look. There's very little money going around, right? I got this in this position. These guys, they, this is how they justify it, you know. These people, if they give me, you know, whatever it is, 50 euros, it's not going to hurt them at all. But for me, it's really good. So what's wrong with it, you know? Um, and obviously, they combine that with the fact that they know they're not going to get in any trouble. And mm. boom, you know, they feel kind of justified to do it or they justify it to themselves. Um, but it's it's terrible, man. It's terrible. It's a very big crime, well, in in yani had to shut uh, Of course, very, very big course. crime. Um, but I feel like they they also might have, you know, if they see you with family, this is the good thing in in our cultures is that if they see you with kids and stuff, they actually have a rahma. They they would probably let you off or whatever. Um, I, there's a small amount that would even push you further, okay? But I think most people, they kind of, they're good like that, you know? Yeah, ideally. It's a shame, like, even even when you talk about, like, uh, the way they rack up prices as well for for people just because they know that they're not from around here. Like, yeah, I understand that the whole... I suppose we're talking about a situation we're not really in. We have, mm. have to deal with uh, in mm-hmm. terms of living there and having to only make money from tourist season to tourist season you know mm. um, but it's crazy like the prices just get shot right up uh, mm. and then you you know when you convince them that you're actually wilted bled you know then they think oh okay <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's what you have to do you have to put it on them though so they don't do it next time yeah but that's what I was going to say about any time when you know it's obvious they're looking for a bribe if you you can go hard on them yeah sometimes this is it could go either one of two ways though you go hard you shout at them you tell them you tell them you don't you know and all of this um either they will have shame and they will be like okay go on then get get out my face kind of thing yeah. or they might make it even more trouble for you and stop you detain you longer and all of this so depends but a lot of the time i've seen i've seen uh my cousins and stuff the, the police will stop you. Let's say there's a checkpoint. The police stop you and they'll say, oh, there's something wrong with your registration or something wrong with this and that. They just want money, right? Yeah. My cousin just goes straight to him and just be like, look, you're not getting anything off me today. You can detain me. You can keep me. Whatever. Do whatever you want. But I'm just telling you right now that you're not getting anything off me. And most of the time, yeah. more than half the time, they'll just let you go. So mm. uh, that's one way of dealing with it. Um. You know, I actually aim to do this, part of this episode about kind of the differences between the UK and the UAE, you know, because it's, you know, I, I went to the UK three months and I'm back now. And, you know, you only can really see the differences when um, when you actually have lived in both places and, and you spend time there and then you return and you really feel the differences, subhanAllah. Like, yeah. I had a culture shock when I went back to the UK. Um and so I just thought it's it's an outsider's view, kind of what the UK is like, what I noticed. And, you know, I've got to admit, bro, that the UK has many good things. Uh, it has a lot of the, you know, when I was living in the UK, I didn't, I guess I didn't recognize these things as being that good or that significant. Um, but then when you leave, you, then you feel it, when, especially when you leave and you come back, you yeah. know. Um, for example, yeah. I was trying to think, is there anything in the UK that is cheaper? Sorry, that is more expensive than in the UAE. Yeah, a lot of people, they, they might move abroad because it's cheaper. But I'm, I'm here in UAE, I'm thinking, is the one thing more expensive in the UK than here? It's kind of crazy, you know. Um, the only thing I could think of is car insurance. Car insurance is much, much cheaper here. But almost everything well. else, what? Maybe fuel as well. 
Oh yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, those are the only things, bro. It's crazy. It's really. I don't know how this happened, but uh, it got very expensive here, man. Even even, bro. Uh, I believe. Well, we don't use gas here, but electricity and water is more expensive here. Um, and yeah, I suppose if you're selective in eating out, like where you eat out, you can find places cheaper than UK. But then again, like UK, you've got like two pound fifty chicken and chips if you really want, isn't it? True. So, so it's subhanallah. Very, very. I was talking to somebody in London when I was there about this thing, you know, about the difference. And I worked it out. Yeah, the more you earn, the better UAE is for you. But if you're not earning that much, the amount that you're saving from not paying income tax is 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 like negligible, right? So yeah. that's how it works out here, basically. If you're earning a lot, then that amount of tax you're not paying because you're working here instead of there, that is going to give you a big financial boost. But if your income tax is not huge anyway, then, you know, maybe the higher expenses here and stuff, um, they'll kind of eat you up kind of thing. So, yeah, basically, the more you earn, the better it is here. Um, that's the main, the main difference in money is the tax paying income tax or not paying mm. that's the main difference otherwise it's probably the same cost of living how, so, how about um mm. like general safety like do you feel safer in the uk or the uae you know personally i feel uh, i feel equally safe however in the uk you definitely have to take more precautions you know um you get used to stuff here like you know I wouldn't think twice about leaving my laptop on show in my car, you know. Um, really? You can even, um, I don't really do this, but you can easily, if you, for example, in the summer, it's very hot. You don't want to turn your car off because then the engine will, uh, the AC will turn off. So some people, they leave the AC on, they leave the whole car engine on when they go to pray. For example, they, they leave the car running, they go in the masjid pray and come out. And they have no reason in their mind to believe that the car will be gone when they come back. Right, yeah. Um, so definitely, bro, that's the, one of the big th reasons people come here is, is for that as well, which is great. I think I underestimate it because the UK is relatively safe. Um, the UAE is safe. You know, and the only other place I know that well is Algeria. Um, Algeria, Annie... You have to adapt your lifestyle to be safe, but generally I fi find it quite safe. But you've got to avoid certain things like going out certain places at night time and, and stuff like that. Right, yeah. But um, but yeah, definitely, bro. Safety is a big one, uh, a big one. You don't have to think of safety whatsoever over here. That's true. Um, another a big difference I found when going to the UK from here is the the culture of individualism is much stronger in the UK. Um, and, you know, you find it in uh, advertisements, you find it in people's day-to-day -day talk, you find it on TV shows or whatever, where it's like very much the worship of the self, the worship of the desires, um, you know. Like, for example, you find this kind of language like, oh, you deserve this, you indulge in this. You know, all these, like, language that basically assumes you know you deserve luxuries and you just follow your desires and pleasure basically very hedonistic kind of thing yeah. um that's definitely much stronger in the uk and um and indiv individualism what i mean by that is like um not family not being as as important as pushed to the forefront you can't yeah it's it's not nice it's not not it's not fair to say People don't care about family in the UK, okay? But just compared to elsewhere, it's much, it's much different, you know, much different. Um, so that was a big one. And just like, I don't know, man, I don't know how to say it other than some stuff like just filth that you wouldn't see here. You, yeah. you kind of come across it over there. So yeah. culturally, those are kind of the main things. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I think I don't interact with too many people in the UK. Like even when I when I go there, when I was there for a few months, it's like I'm interacting mostly with family, with uh, friends, people that I've kind of filtered to be, you know, good company. But if I was working there, I've got to interact with these people. I mean, I was working there uh, one time and you just come across, 
I don't know, sometimes I feel like the UK culture is a little bit negative, a lot of complaining involved, and that can easily bring you down, bring your morale down. Mm. So that was that's another kind of difference. Um, yeah, a lot of complaining. People really don't know how, how good they have it. You know, for example, one thing I always go on about is the tube, the London tube. Yeah. I cannot fathom how you can complain about that thing. Yeah. Like, it's amazing, bro. It is absolutely amazing. Even if you compare it to anywhere on earth, you know, compare it to, um, uh, what's it called? Hong Kong, Tokyo, um, e you know, the top, top cities in the world. And, uh, you know, the London transport system is up there, you know, it's probably Definitely. it's top 10. Definitely. So if you're in the top 10 in transport systems in the whole world, and you're still complaining, then definitely the problem's with you, not with the, uh, the transport system. I was exposed to the tube system like quite late, like yeah. maybe when I was in college, you know, that's yeah. when I first sort of went up there. And started. Although I remember using it when I was young, but I couldn't sort of remember, you know, what it was all about. I must have been mm. very young, my dad took me. But yeah, okay. on my own sort of thing, as a, in, in, in recent memory, I was in college and I went there and it was just incredible. Like I, I found it so, crazy how like it was almost like i was a uh, what was it called like a meerkat like popping my head out of different sort of stations <laughs> the the surroundings were completely different in different areas just to show like how quickly yeah. we're getting from one area to another um, mm. and i just thought it was phenomenal especially for the price as well like yeah not, not that expensive mm. um another thing obviously that people take for granted and i had we had this conversation yesterday at work about uh obviously the healthcare system the nhs yeah there's oh, everyone real. complains about it but mm. you know to, it's just <laughs> in america for example you, you, yeah. you know you get hit by a car or something the ambulance might just leave you there because you can't yeah. afford to pay you haven't got insurance yeah. or whatever yeah yeah bro there was a story of a a lady here in the uae she didn't have health insurance i, I can't remember if she was living here or she was just here for a few months kind of temporarily and she went into she was pregnant she went into very very early labor like um i think they actually uh did a cesarean to get the baby out because it was very dangerous uh, something right. happened yeah so the baby was born after something crazy like just 22 weeks okay which uh, you know for people maybe don't know um, a normal time to be born is like 40 weeks isn't it yeah so 40 or 42 weeks so um so, the, yeah, so Im imagine a baby being born in 20 weeks when it's 20 weeks old, right? Um, so it's very, very fragile, very delicate, and they have to keep it in an incubator just to keep it alive, right? And it, it, it was alive, though. But you can imagine every day it's there in the incubator. She's racking up bill, bill after bill after it. And she was, she was there in hospital. The baby's in hospital for a long time, maybe a month, and she racked up a bill of... I think it was, a, let's say, around 300,000 dirham. So that's like, I think, 50,000 pounds. Yeah. And th that was her bill. And she was like, bro, she, did, I don't, she didn't have a job. Only her husband had a job. And her husband, maybe his salary was like 2,000 pounds a month. How, is, how are you ever going to even dream of paying that off? What are you even going to do? And the hospital wouldn't let her go because uh, I think they were saying, well, firstly, you have to pay. And secondly, the baby can't leave the incubator. It will die. So imagine the situation she was in. Anyway, she got some uh, attention from the press and they published an article about her and there are a few places you can go for help about these things. And somebody basically paid at least half of it. So I think, let's say if the bill was 300,000, somebody, a very generous person paid 150,000 of it and then the hospital dropped the other half of the bill or something and and you know that's then she was able to leave and stuff so you know that's the kind of thing that can happen man it just happens to very very generous people behind the scenes you know you don't know who these people are and they're just willing to really help people out who are in that kind of situation yeah. um, well like, my, that's like that's yeah. that's such a that's such a cool position to be in though um, mm. like as far as and a lot of those best my intentions and stuff but as far mm. as you know attaining wealth and stuff like that's the sort of person i want to be like someone yeah. who's completely um like obviously helping from a distance but nobody knows who they are yes i think like it, well, imagine yeah. what an amazing sort of uh opportunity that is to just yeah. scope out people that are in dire situations and 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 being the 
being the sort of outlet for a blessing of relief that they would have never seen coming it's crazy yeah yeah definitely man that's it's really nice my my friend's um mom works in a hospital here and she said there are tons of cases like that and there are always people just paying paying for people paying for people you know Mm. uh i mean may allah reward them man um so yeah that that's definitely that's something very good with the nhs you know the nhs has has kind of it's gotten worse right hasn't it uh, over the last few years but it's still right. free and it's still you know you could say very good by world standards so yeah, the, the the reason why i think it struggles the most obviously yeah cuts and stuff like that yeah. but it's this sense of um it's a lack of accountability from the general population. If something's free, then they don't value it as much. Yeah. And yeah. if it's not valued as much, then it's not looked after. So people people will turn up to A and E's or whatever for just stupid things. Yeah. Um, and obviously, we've got to uh, imagine the, the strain on the system when it comes to Friday, Saturday nights. Um, mm. It's unbelievable. If you ever been to an A and E sort of um, department in one of mm. those nights, mate, it's crazy just people mm. that are there that don't need to be there or, sh- or self-inflicted stupidness yeah um, yeah same with air, same with most services like <laughs> there's a lot there's a lot that gets policed there's a lot that gets attended to by paramedics there's a lot that mm. we go to um that is all self-inflicted stupidity that mm. actually and bro like this got me thinking as well uh i, I can't remember what we were what i was looking into but it was like um it showed you the, the concept that just because of one thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited that mm. they that the rest of this society here want to carry on doing or, or mm. do that mm. the amount of uh, of sort of uh, what's the word contingencies that we need to consider mm. are incredible like one thing it could be one thing like uh, getting getting married before having intimate relationship right yeah so Getting married but before having an intimate relationship is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained upon all the Muslims, right? And because mm. because Allah knows us better than we know ourselves, so that's mm. why, right? Yeah. But because that isn't a thing here, the sort of <laughs> the tree of, of the branching sort of contingencies that we need to have for when this goes wrong or when this goes wrong or when yeah. this goes wrong. So, you know, sexually transmitted diseases or um, sexual assaults or rape or do you understand like the, mm. this could go on and then the contingencies that we have in place for all of those things and then the, all the industry and the organizations and the infrastructure that goes into place to police and to make sure that everyone's healthy and everyone's happy and everyone gets what they want sort of thing and the yeah. justice system that has to deal with that and the, do you understand like yeah, yeah. it's insane all, yeah. and it all comes back to that mm. one thing yeah you know or, or two things or two alcohol things, yeah. and then the whole culture of uh, whatever you want to call it dating or whatever Exactly, and uh, those, you know, those two it, things. It's it's insane because I think there's that ignorant notion that if we do what we want, then we'll be happy. But actually, <laughs> to do what you want, society yeah. itself has to accommodate for that in a way mm. that strains society so much that it comes back to bite you in the in in, in the backside. Yeah, so to speak. yeah. I mean, bro, I'm sure, yeah, and Allah alam. But in fifty years or a hundred years people will just wonder why alcohol was allowed Hmm. you know uh with all the problems that it brings i know it's true alcohol has been allowed for hundreds of years in many parts of the world but it's just shocking really it's one of the most illogical things you can think of you know um that and and smoking as well and and i'm sure in the future you will look back and you'll say why did we allow these extremely high sugar drinks and foods as well because yeah. that's another area where the nhs is under strain you know obesity Definitely. um Definitely. you know again you can easily call that self-inflicted and one easy way of helping people out like genuinely helping people out is to ban some of these some of these foods you know these yeah. foods they're just so tempting man that's one uh, other difference that you have in the uk is I don't know what it is, whether it's the packaging, whether it's the language used, whether it's the um, diversity of choice you have, but food is really made more attractive. It's so tempting over there, man. Mm. Um, and I feel like the average person is, it's like, a, uh, I don't know, like a, 
just innocently going by their, you know, going about their life, and there's just these people just trying to sell them poison, basically, man. Yeah, it's and the it's... business of it, though, isn't it? I mean, you know, there's entire corporate departments that, that you know, research and development um, mm. is all about how, you know, how the, the certain crunch and the flavor combination yes. is more attractive, and the, yes. the packaging and everything mm. is all there mm. to sort of. It's all psychologically like, and the thing is, this is yeah. what someone, I can't remember where I heard this or where I was listening to, um, but they were talking about how like the human mind hasn't changed in, you know, millennia, right? It's okay. been the same. And obviously they, they might be talking about an evolutionary sort of, uh, mm. you know, idea. But generally speaking, from what we know anyway, the human mind is more or less the same. It's been the same since, you know, the dawn of man. Mm -hmm. um, but we, because we've had all of that time to study the human mind, and to to know what you know makes it tick then yeah. we can we will always forever be adapting our stuff towards that so right now we're at the the cutting edge of that adaption of 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 tailoring our product to the human mind to make yeah. us more sort of addicted to it i'm sure yeah. this was stuff that happened time ago like people would have noticed that you know people start salivating when they can hear when they can smell you mm. know food being cooked or whatever so then they they go and extend on that, extend on that, extend on that. So now we are <laughs> sort of at the at the will of of this marketing sort of uh, you know the end, the cutting edge of the research and development of of food marketing, for example. Mm. And and Lord knows what else we're going to have in another thousand years if we are to, to if the human race is to live that long. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, perhaps by then, you know, we would have collapsed and rebuilt <laughs> because things are kind of. Even from a material point of view, things are not looking too good. Although you could say there is a bit of a change. Like, I don't know, man. There is a big push, like in the UK, towards health or vegan, whatever it is, lower calorie thing. But yeah. it seems like in the end, people are held hostage by their, their desires, if you like. And yeah. a very strong desire is just to eat sugar and salt and fat you know yeah. um so it's it's, it's, crazy, it's interesting man. because you know a lot of this is habitual stuff so we fall into habits and like i'm sure you've studied as well um habits don't get broken uh through willpower they get broken mainly through a change of environment like changing the environment you're surrounded in and if your mm. whole society is directed to that then mm -hmm. it becomes super difficult because yeah you can change what's in your house but you can't change what's out there Yes, you know? and how many times is it that you've you've stuck to a, a solid diet, but then you're out and you you need to eat something and you haven't got anything yeah. available to you immediately apart from you know a mm. you know fast food sort of outlet or something like that. Yeah, um, and it might not even be that. Yeah, you could say, oh well, I could go in, in here and get a uh, you know something healthy, but then you can smell mm. <laughs> or mm. see the the uh, the alternative options just next to it or just around the corner yeah, it. yeah. so and you know a big problem is it's often cheaper to have the fast food stuff exactly that's what gets me to be honest bro like you know I don't mind eating fast food uh, now and then like I don't consider that terrible thing to do yeah um, the thing that gets to me is that if I want to whenever I eat out if I want to eat something healthier I'm gonna pay maybe double yep so Definitely. especially in UAE, I feel like because it's less mainstream to eat healthier stuff, it's less of a culture thing. Um, yeah, you're going to pay more. It's be it's more of a niche thing to eat yeah. healthy. So uh, that's that's tricky. But, you know, these companies, what they would say is, yes, we're engineering it to be attractive, but we never told you to eat 16 chocolate bars, well, uh, you know, a week yeah. or whatever. You know, we never told you to do that. I think in their case, they don't really have a leg to stand on with that because they should know, they do know that sugar is addicting. Yeah. Um, but, but you know, as somebody who works in marketing, you know, it's, it's a fine line that you've got to walk. Um, and I always think of myself as filtering out those who would benefit from the product and then persuading those to actually jump over the fence and buy. Yeah. But I'm not interested in persuading those who wouldn't benefit to jump over the fence you get it that's what i try and do um in the way i do things um and i think that that's kind of a good way to go about it that you kind of want to dissuade people who would not benefit from buying you don't want them to buy yeah um 
but yeah when it comes to selling chocolate and stuff i don't know how you would deal with that issue so i'm not gonna start any chocolate company anytime soon <laughs> <laughs> uh, um uh what was i gonna say about this uh yeah so the so the nhs the nhs is really really good um what was uh, another difference? Yeah, I, actually, I was saying quite a few negative things about the UK, but I was going to say, bro, that coming back now to the UAE from the UK and um, taking everything into account, honestly, the UK is a very attractive place to live in that, like, for my short-term kind of comfort, okay? Yeah. Um, you know, you've you got the NHS, it's free. A lot of things are cheaper over there. Um the public transport's nice. Getting anything done with the government is extremely smooth. Um, you know, all of these things, you know, uh, like even the higher petrol cost, it's like manageable, you know, whether you, you know, you uh, carpool or you like take public transport. Right. Like yeah. there, are, there are actually so many things, like even the, the stuff you can buy in the shops, like it's cheaper to eat healthy over there probably. Um, so there's so many things that are attractive and just more comfortable for me over there. But then just when I think about it, when I balance it out um, long term, I just feel like I, I've got to forego those short term comforts. Um, and and that's why I feel like ultimately I'm still better off over here. Yeah. Uh, just just kind of being shielded from some of those extremely negative things, even if there is uh, some, you know, short term positive things, you know. Yeah, that's it, isn't it? Like the 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 positives are quite. They're, they're quite prominent there's quite a lot of positives but mm. they're not like highly impactful positives they're just sort of they're mm. nice to have a lot of the time yeah um, but then the negatives are just way up like on the if you were looking to look at it on the graph it'd be up in the red like the yeah, yeah. That you can potentially be exposed to it just insane. yeah especially when it comes to kids like yeah. when it comes to when you have kids it's it becomes a bit of a no-brainer it's like like I don't want to raise kids who feel inferior to non-Muslims. I don't want to raise kids who um, have the same kind of all the same cultural norms as non-Muslims. Like yeah. I don't really want that, you know. So uh, you know, it's it's tricky, man. It's tricky. It's tricky. But yeah. Um, do we have any questions to answer? Any um, comments? Okay, let's have a look. We wrap things up a little bit. Um, curious cat. Oh, we've got something. For, I'm very bad at checking this, aren't I? Uh, <laughs> okay. Assalamu alaikum. I really benefited from the new podcast upload. I think this was probably the Hajj one. Um, okay. This is more of a personal related question, but may benefit others. I've always been stuck between either going to Umrah or completing the. Uh, or completing the farad, farad by completing Hajj first. My uh -huh. father may be taking my mum to Hajj in 2020. Should I take full advantage of this possible chance of going with my only mahram, or do you think going with close family members can be distracting from the main aim? I similarly have never been to Mecca, and my mum will likely need some help and guidance. Shazakallah khair. Wait, what did she say? Uh, what's her? She said her dad's going. Uh, is he going my to father, Hajj or Umrah? My father may be taking my mum to Hajj in 2020. So, because she hasn't been to Umrah before, mm. she's wondering if her first time should be Hajj with her father because yeah. she might not get another opportunity to go with a mahram. Oh, isn't that a no-brainer? I think that's a no-brainer, personally. Wait, so the, wait, people, let, let me get this straight. The, yeah. the, thought, the thought process is that everybody does Umrah first. Um, oh, is it? To sort of see what, what, what it's all about. Mm. But I can imagine that, you know, for, for a woman, like the, the Prophet Sallallahu said, that the jihad Sallam. of a woman is Hajj, right? Yes. Am I correct in saying that? Yeah. So, so if, if that's the case, then take the opportunity because it's not always going to be like, you know, there's, there's women in my family now that don't have a mahram anymore and it's really, they'd love to go, but it's really difficult for them. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Like yeah. your husband passed away or some of them never got married. So it's just mm. like, well, what do you do? Um, mm hmm this is opportunities right in front of you, mate. I'd grasp it because at least that way, you've 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 done your obligation. Whether you whether you know, Allah Alam, but whether it's accepted or not, at least you've made the intention and the obligations fulfilled, right? Yeah. Um, 
and there's always going to be the chance well yes I can re, you know make up for that again by possibly going again if the opportunity arises again but at least what was mandatory upon me and what was sort of weighing on my head because that's where you got to look at it with your with obligations obligations are a huge weight hanging over your head by a thread you know and you won't be able to remove that unless you um, like that's the anxiety that you should be feeling about an obligation mm-hmm. because it, it's similarly to, to like sins like we should be seeing sins as this huge mountain like waving over our head like the Sahaba used to see it yeah. so it's always on your mind it's just conscious, constant, eh, constant <laughs> sort of worry so as soon as yeah. you can get that obligation out of the way then mm. you can you can focus and I say out of the way obviously you focus on it and try and attain as much blessings and reward from it but there's always um, the opportunity to supersede that with extra stuff uh, with mm. extra ibadah with extra hajj or umrah or whatever later on in your life but if the opportunity mm-hmm. comes in front of you can you possibly face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knowing that the opportunity was there and you didn't take it you know yeah Bro, what what is she saying the alternative is to going to Hajj with her dad? Waiting, uh, is that the alternative? Basically, it's not the alternative. It's do you think that going with close family members can be distracting from the main aim? So should I wait oh. until I can go? But the, oh. you're always going to go with someone as a, as a woman, surely. Yeah, exactly. It might be more distracting with your husband. Yeah. So it might be more, and if, yeah. let's say hypothetically, you were going on your own, whether that's permissible or not. Hypothetically, you'll meet you'll get you might be more distracted going on your own because you're so worried about certain, you know, looking after yes. yourself or knowing where to go or whatever. Yeah, but if you're with someone who's in charge, you can relinquish a lot of control and a lot of worry. Yeah, I mean, there's yeah, there's no doubt about this. If you can go Hajj, you go Hajj as soon as possible. If you could go Hajj tomorrow, go Hajj tomorrow, even though it's not the season, but. Yeah, that's no no brainer for me. Um, I said in the in the episode, I said you know I found benefit, and a few other people found benefit in going alone. But like, that's because we just happen to be alone, kind of thing. Like yeah. a lot of people can't make the decision to go alone. So, so yeah, go with your parents. Help your parents. It's, imagine help going Hajj number one, and number two going Hajj and helping your parents. Wow, like yeah. that's a big opportunity. Um, and yani, how do I say it? It's not like you're not going to lose anything, even if you don't feel the same buzz that you might if you were like fully focused on yourself and your own abed in Hajj. Yeah, it, that's not a loss if the distraction comes from helping your parents. Like, of course, your parents, like your parents, had your parents. <laughs> yeah, so. Of so it's very. It's an. I would. I would actually consider it an opportunity that you can go with your parents. Yeah. Um, not a bad thing. You know. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, you know, let's let's not let's not be uh, ignorant to the fact that there's hundreds of thousands of people that would love to go with their parents and just yeah. don't or can't. Maybe yes. because their parents aren't interested, or maybe because you know they've mm. lost their parents or whatever. So yeah. You know, if this is an opportunity on the plate, then subhanallah, go for it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. That's quite an easy decision to make, I think. Bro, I've, I, I I use this podcast app called, um, what's it called? Castbox. Okay? okay. And you can leave comments on the on a podcast. So there are two comments on our uh, on our one. Yeah. All oh, right. One is from June 2018. Okay. Oh, wow. So this this uh, lady, she says uh, it was episode 11, Halal Income. Oh, wow. uh, I can't remember oh, what I can't see the rest of the topic she said uh, this episode resonates with me on so many levels okay cool and then <laughs> episode 24 um, it was the episode we did on f- feminism right and uh, someone commented saying this man just said is all oppression bad <laughs> <laughs> and that was me I must have I was, when I read this I'm thinking did I say that is all oppression bad I'm trying to think, what did I mean by that? I haven't like gone back to listen to the episode, but I think what I meant is, uh, Yanni, you, if you're being stopped from doing something, yeah. then it might be a good thing for you. I think that's what I meant. Uh, well, yeah, maybe, there's silver uh, linings, aren't there? Not just silver linings, but like we're talking about, like for example, alcohol, you're being held back from drinking alcohol. Some people might call that oppression. Like obviously oh, non, right. non-Muslims yeah. might call that oppression, but it's actually... 
a huge blessing so not all oppression is bad in that sense <laughs> maybe i think that's what i meant <laughs> yeah let's just assume the best of yourself <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh let's have a look let's just have a look oh i think we're i think we're pretty much at the end of the show bro mm. you know bro since you you mentioned on the freshly grounded episode that you know basically you talked about your job so i think we should do an episode on that uh, if you don't mind, that would be yeah. very, very juicy. Juicy, because, yeah, juicy. very yeah. interesting, man. Um, yeah, inshallah, we're gonna we got to keep these going, man. Like uh, when you're in Morocco, we need to kind of work something out. Um, I should have a, I should have internet there. I'm gonna okay, see if I can take see. my um, my this this extremely versatile setup that I have on my laptop <laughs> yeah. and a microphone over there. <laughs> Fully portable. Fully portable. Fully portable. Yeah. Four-hour work week, baby. <laughs> Did he finish the book yet? Uh, no, because I I went back to listening to the book that I was listening to before it, which okay. was Atomic Habits, and now I've got uh, basically my, my Audible subscription. I I had an Audible subscription. Yeah. I keep forgetting to cancel, so every month I keep getting mm. a new sort of credit to yeah. buy a new book, and I keep getting another one. So. Yeah. Let me see what I've got. Let me let me just uh, s- sound up. I think it's, it'll be good to um, always sound off with what we're lis- listening to or reading. Um, hmm. But let me tell you a secret, bro. Go for if it. you go to cancel your Audible, oh, they will yeah. usually offer. Um, they will offer you a half price for three months. Right. Um, or they might offer you. What is, what's the other one? They offer. They have a few down sales that they offer you. So. Um, you might want to do that, man. You get I do that right now. Instead, of, it's eight month, eight pounds a month, isn't it? So yeah. you you can get it for four pounds a month for three months or something, just to keep you on. Uh, let's see. So and then you could also pause it, of course. I've got. So I've listened to "The Obstacle Is the Way" by mm-hmm. Ryan Holiday. Mm-hmm. Love that one. Mm-hmm. Uh, we listened to "Nonviolent Communication," didn't we? Yes. Marshall yeah. Rosenberg. That was interesting. I can't mm-hmm. remember much from it. No. We'll have to listen to it again. Mm. Uh, Ego is the enemy. Mm-hmm. I've I've listened to it, but I've also got the paperback now. Uh, my sister bought me okay. it. I might read it again because I won't lie. Like that book changed my life, bro. Mm. <laughs> like, Wait, which um, one is this? Ego is the enemy. Uh, Ego is the enemy is by Ryan mm. Holiday. So what what was she trying to say about you by buying you that book? I think she just follows me on Instagram, so she knows that <laughs> I love it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but it really just completely like. Hadith the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam regarding you know the person with atoms worth of pride won't enter paradise um, yeah. was always something that although I um, although I was greatly affected by I wanted mm. to sort of practically understand how to apply that um, mm. and I think with a lot of the, a lot of the, the deen I think a lot of it is locked away behind Arabic language right mm. when you don't have that it's you struggle you know the goal you know where you want to be you know what you want to achieve. It's just mm-hmm. getting there practically and implementing that into your life in a practical step-by-step process can be quite difficult. Yeah. Um, that's yeah. at least for myself. So, mm. yes, you could argue, well, what you're reading and what you're listening to isn't an Islamic sort of perspective, but the the goal is the same. Mm-hmm. You know, The ultimate mm-hmm. goal for oneself is the same, which is, yes. in this specific example, ego is the enemy. Like, mm. yes, he might be destroying his ego for a particular reason, mm. but... I know why I'm doing it, and this is why mm. I want to achieve it. So, mm. Mm. you know. So yeah. anyway, change my that, life that, completely. That that reminds me of something. Is you know, I was thinking that in the UK, this is another reflection on coming back here. In the UK, I was much more connected to people. Um, whether it's, I don't know, like sometimes people want to talk to you because in the UK, like English is like the language, common language. Everyone really speaks it. Yeah. People tend to speak to each other more, I think, because of that. Yeah. Um, uh, whereas here, it's like, okay, one guy I might speak to in uh, English, another guy in Arabic, another guy right. in broken Arabic. Yeah. And it's like, that's why I feel there's not much mixing between people. Because, for example, there's millions, like out of 10 million people in the UAE, there might be six or seven million Indians, only Indians, yeah? Yeah. Now, how many of those speak very good English or very good Arabic? Like very yeah. few of them, right? So therefore, that entire population is kind of separated from me, just as an example for me. Yeah. So it's unlikely I'm going to like get into flowing conversations with these people, you know? So 
I'm I'm quite isolated from from people in general, and I've actually realised that, you know, like sometimes me and you, we're, when we talk on the podcast, we we you're kind of like the guy living the real life, and I'm living in my bubble. <laughs> that's <not> often <laughs> how it is, yeah. And that's what I realise is that probably a huge amount of the quote unquote complications that come in in life comes from people, comes from knowing people, interacting with people. You know, like people are unpredictable and stuff just happens when there are people, right? So that's probably maybe why my life is a bit simpler, I think, than a lot of people's, is because I don't have many people in my life. Um, and, and that's good in that way, but terrible in another way. Like, I'm realizing now, like, you really need, I mean, personally, I feel I'm like, oh, kind of okay with just having a very few friends, but it's not just friends, it's about uh, acquaintances, you know, people you know, like network, um, for example, you want to grow this podcast, well, then you need to know people who maybe have a podcast or they know somebody who has a big podcast. That's how yeah. you're going to get on other other people's podcasts, you know, to grow your podcast. Yeah. Uh, you want a job, you want um, to get married, you want to get your son married, your daughter married. It's all through knowing people. So uh, the older I get, the more I realize it's a burden. It's not a burden. It's a disadvantage to not know people, you yeah, know. Really. Um, and so there's good and bad in this whole um, bubble thing. Definitely. Um, so that's just a thought I had because definitely, bro. Like this year of this this 2019 year of mine has been um, like I set out on a mission to network, right? Mm. Um, and you know, it came from a realization that in Brian, I only knew one person or two people, yeah. and even that started fading because people started moving away. Um, mm. Actually on the face of it now there is no one here now and i'm not saying like oh there's no muslims here i'm saying that there's no one at all i'm not even exaggerating mm. that i have like a relationship that with you now. know yeah yeah because mm. um you know the two last people one moved to a different side of town which is quite far the other one mm. moved to london and that's it you know it's gone wow. so okay. so i came to that realization i said well stick my neck out and you know invest in myself in the sense of investing in because at the end of the day yeah someone could see you know gathering in a social event as a waste of time but mm. if your intention is to sort of invest in yourself and and, and improve your own standing and improve your opportunities mm. and exposure mm. then yeah invest in yourself and that's what i saw it yeah. i saw those long drives up back and forth to london or seeing an event going on and being part of it or whatever or sticking my head out there as mm. part of the um part of that self-investment process do you know what i mean yeah, there's no, there's no way you can see that as a waste of time. I mean, even me, you know, Mr. Robot, um, I, I remember when we were in London, I was telling you that I try and spend one day a week, like that's when I socialize, that's when I see friends. And, you know, these are people who, it's not networking because these are people I've known now for years. Yeah. But it's just, uh, I recognize it's good to, to speak to people, to nurture relationships, to learn from each other, whatever comes out of it, to be honest. You don't need an excuse. That's a normal human activity to Definitely. speak to people. It becomes, it goes more towards wasting when it's like day after day, like, you know, that kind of thing. But once a week, like one day a week is perfect, I think. For somebody who's like trying to do a lot, like get a lot done, one yeah. day a week is good. For someone who's less high standard, maybe two days a week would be fine, you know? So... So yeah, um, going back to Audible, bro, I've got oh, yeah. 34 titles in my library. That's what it's telling me. Oh, wow. So, but I've been on this for a while. I've got so many. The good thing is you get to keep these books, you know, so you, you know, you can listen to it again whenever you want. Um, yeah, I still got um, the four hour work week, obviously, I've got about seven mm. or eight hours left of that. Atomic mm. Habits by James Clear. That's what I'm sort of listening to mostly now. I also recently got 12 Rules of Life by Jordan Peterson. Oh, okay. I had that, but I returned it. Oh, really? Yeah. Why did you return it? Um, how? Why did I return it? I, I didn't find it that beneficial, that useful, that interesting compared yeah. to his random YouTube clips. Like, oh, okay. I feel like, you know what I like? I like his psychology stuff way more than his... Um, I don't know what you want to call it, philosophy stuff. I don't, I don't oh, know. I thought this but, was more psychology then. Maybe I was wrong. Yeah, I mean, obviously, there's always going to be an element of that. But I, you know, why I, I really started to love his stuff is because of the breakthroughs in understanding I got by listening to his stuff on YouTube, right? Yeah. 
um, and I listened to that and then I kind of got the gist and I got a load of breakthroughs from listening to that. And now I start listening to his book and his book just has way less breakthroughs for me and uh. way less really interesting stuff. And then, then I returned it, right? And then after I returned it, I realized 12 Rules for Life, like it's actually one of those books which is very directly about your philosophy on life. And right, therefore, yeah. it's something where really it's more uh, an Islamic place you should re be getting that stuff from. Mm -hmm. Allah Alam. That is, so, what I, I, that is sort mm. of the, not the fear, but the sort of apprehension I suppose mm. I had initially. Um, yeah. But I, because I, like similar to you, I was looking at a lot of those philosophy, uh, I keep saying philosophy, <laughs> a lot of like the psychology sort of research and breakthroughs and yeah. analysis of how the mind works. Yes. Uh, I thought this would be more of that, but I guess yeah. it might not be. I mean, the thing with Audible, you can always return it, you know, listen to it a little bit and then return it right. if you don't like it. Um I don't want to like put you off, but I just returned it. That's all. Um, the thing with Jordan Peterson is, I think for a Muslim, half of what he says is very in line and very interesting, very good. But uh -huh. then there is half where it's it's a bit like not really, dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I can uh, for example, he's a, he. I think he calls himself a libertarian, right? So he doesn't believe in the state having much uh, say on what individuals do. He believes in freedom or you know being a very high value and that will often contradict directly with a muslim's philosophy on life so right you know those are areas where obviously we wouldn't agree with him um but yeah um i'm listening to well I, i'm i what i'm currently listening to it's called barking up the wrong tree let me just uh what's the the surprising science behind why everything you know about success is mostly wrong so um, this book is interesting. It's not very practical, to be honest. But it's, it, for example, you might say you might have something which seems very logical to you, like uh, people who people who know more people get further in life. Yeah. Let's say he has a, he might have a chapter about this whole concept, this whole assumption. Yeah. And he'll be he'll show how there is a correlation. But then he'll explain how when you look into the details, you realize it's not because they know a lot of people. It's for another reason. Yeah, you get it. So it's all it's like uh, debunking these kind of assumptions. It's more of an interesting one rather than a beneficial one, to be honest. Um, and then I pre-ordered and now it's, it's just been released a few days ago. Um, Stillness is the key, which is uh, Ryan Holiday's new that. book. I was just looking at that right now. <laughs> I literally just um, I just refunded the the Jordan Peterson book. <laughs> oh, you, you did it right that. now on the podcast. <laughs> yeah, I just refunded it, and then I got the credit back, and I thought, oh yeah, there's that stillness is the key book. Let me read it, Matt, because I really wanted to get that. Um, mm, yeah, you just mentioned it as I was looking at it. Yeah, so this one I just got uh, come into my library because I pre-ordered it. So I guess I might return this barking up the wrong tree on, and I'll just listen to Ryan Holiday. Personally, bro, I think Ryan Holiday's books, um, at least these three that we've mentioned, it's a very good format. If somebody wanted to take the Islamic teachings and turn it into something practical and kind of entertaining even, um, the way he does it with the stories and all of that, I think it's yeah. kind of maybe a model to look at um, because it, they've been very popular, which means they're very digestible, a lot of stories, and then obviously instead of taking from uh, stoicism or whatever we just take from islam but i'm just mean the format and the structure is nice yeah definitely definitely so i'll right. be listening to that one inshallah uh this has been an episode of mind heist episode 48 <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah amin is back in the uae alhamdulillah and um I'm still in the UK. Nothing, no surprises over here. If you have <laughs> any questions, send them to uh, mindheistpodcast at gmail dot com. Mm -hmm. If you have any, I'm, I, you can clearly tell that I'm not very confident with this. If you have any sort of anonymous <laughs> questions, you can send them to curiouscat dot me forward slash mindheistpod. Um, you can also find us on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, it's a good way to sort of get in touch there if uh, if that's easier for you. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, 
you're still a, a ghost. I mean, I keep asking you this every episode, but you're still a ghost on the internet, aren't you? Um, I have my email address and I have my YouTube channel. My YouTube channel is Sierra Masters. My email address is amin at sierramasters.com. Boom. There we go. And I'm, you know me, guys, just read the thing. I'm in the, I'm in the description box. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, bro, let's wrap it up and uh, we'll do another episode soon, inshallah. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum.